Hello everyone, this is Amir from Audio Science Review. It's uh, back to school time again, this time on a topic that may sound trivial, but it actually has a fair amount of complexity underneath. Uh, luckily, you can learn it. Uh, it's just something that's not usually talked about uh, online. Uh, and that is uh, frequency response measurements. Um, you know, you all probably know, have heard of the term and probably have some idea of what it means. Uh, the curves typically look like this. This uh, recent JBL 4349 uh, studio monitor that I tested. And it, it always has two axes. Uh, one is the frequency, the frequency response, and the vertical scale varies depending, depending on what we're showing. In this case, is the SPL or the sound pressure that uh, the uh, uh, speaker is producing. If we're measuring a DAC or amplifier, that'll be the output voltage typically. But it really doesn't matter what this is as long as you know we understand more or less this is the output and, and this is the frequency and, and we look at how that output varies. Now, in case of amplifiers and things, the frequency response is often extremely smooth and flat, and then it rolls off at some point, and we can judge that easily. You don't need to watch this video to learn that. But uh, check out this frequency response. Um, we have a little dip in here. Oops, sorry, you can't see my mouse. Uh, there's a little dip in here. There's a little peak in here. Then more or less is okay, but we've got these little tiny wiggles. Then we have a little valley in here. Then it goes up a little bit. Then we have a broad area that's up here. Then we have some more wiggles. Um, a lot of people who really, you know, diehard objectivists say, well, this is all I need and I can tell you something sounds. Well, my question is, what's, you know, what does this sound like? If you, had, you know, if you had two little shoulders like this versus one, does it make a difference? Um, what if it's this wide? What if it's uh, less than this peak, but broad? What difference does that make? So, and that's a topic that I'm gonna cover in this video um, on this, which is how do we interpret a frequency response uh, measurement from a speaker and, and headphone, where it's never a straightforward, just like the arrow that I've drawn. And so you need to have some skill in interpreting that. Um, so just let's bring up a headphone, for example. This is a Hi-Fi Man uh, Sundara uh, that I recently reviewed. Uh, we look at the frequency response. This part's easy. You say, well, okay, there's less bass way down here. But what about this little wiggle over here? Is that audible? How about this wiggle over here? Um, then we have this broad region where it's just a little bit below our target. How audible is that versus these? Then we have these peaks in here. Uh, how audible are they? How, this, this valley in here. This seems very, very large deviation, correct? So this must surely be a lot more audible than something like this or maybe even this, right? Like this area seems very minor compared to this massive 20, 25 dB uh, changes in frequency response. So clearly we need to have some tools to understand this. I can guarantee you that if you use your lay intuition, it, it would be wrong uh, on this thing. So to understand how we analyze these things, we have to look at psychoacoustics. Psychoacoustics is a research of human hearing and tons and tons of studies have been done in the last 80, 80 years or so on you know how do we perceive sound. Uh, millions of tests with respect to frequency, tonality, sounds going up and down, what have you. And uh, this is done both for medical purposes and also for pleasure as far as you know, music enjoyment and so forth. The key concept I want you to understand in here, which is a gnarly one for any lay person to understand, but <laughs> stay with me. Uh, and it's called the auditory filter bandwidth and it's measured in, in what we call ERB, equivalent rectangular bandwidth. Our hearing system has a, what we call a filter bank, a set of uh, resonators that as the sound uh, agitates those points, you know, we pick up and basically amplifies that, that, that region and we hear it. And the shapes of those auditory filters is actually not pretty. It, it changes with frequency and it has a complex shape. But what is important is that within that auditory filter bank's bandwidth, 
if you have a bunch of sounds, tones that are close together, they essentially get averaged by the ear. The ear can't distinguish between them when they're within one filter bank. So imagine if I tell you numbers one to 100, but you can only have 10, 10 buckets in there, one to 10 and then to 20 and, and so forth. So within those buckets, variations are not as important. The ear basically averages all the spectrum energy in that uh, filter bank. Now, I warned you this would be complex, but um, one simplification we have is, which is called a, this ERB thing, and you can go to the Wikipedia. Unfortunately, this page doesn't have any uh, um, graphs in here, and I, and I should have probably brought one up, but we can simplify the, uh, the auditory filters as being rectangular, as if you just go up like a you know pulse, and we say, if the filter was rectangular, how wide is it? And the width of that filter bank in your hearing system widens as frequencies go up. What does it mean to widen? That means you have less discrimination, which means that more tones are averaged together, and that's how you hear them. So if one frequency is higher and one frequency is lower, they get added up to each other and average out as a total energy. Um, the way that, as I just explained, there's a formula in this uh, Wikipedia that actually tells you you can s grossly simplify this, but it's very useful for this kind of analysis that we want to do back in my envelope analysis. And you can see in here, basically, it just depends on the frequency. And if you plot that, you get a graph that looks like this. Basically, this is 20 hertz at the bottom. Sorry, it's a small graph. And he says that at 20 hertz, our auditory bandwidth is only 25 hertz to 30 hertz. So um, that means very little, very few frequencies are averaged. That means in the context of a speaker in a room where the room activates, uh, magnifies certain frequencies, we actually care about a very narrow analysis of, of those frequencies. But look at what happens at 20,000 hertz. At 20,000 hertz, this thing shoots up to like 3,000 hertz. So a tone, that's a bunch of tones that are at 20,000 hertz. They all get averaged within a three kilohertz bandwidth. Um, so what this means is that as you go left to right in your frequency response, so from here on, variations here are far more audible because the hearing uh, bandwidth, this ERB, is very narrow, which means very, frequent, very few frequencies are added together to build the total uh, energy that your hearing system is going to perceive. Whereas when you get up here, you can see these little wiggles. Your ERB is wider. It's a big chunk over here. It's this wide. So it will average out these things. So these little peaks in the valleys on the right are never heard, whereas the same peaks in the valleys here are audible. So indeed, this can be audible, although, you know, the level is so low here that I personally, you know, wouldn't bother with one or two dB corrections. But if this was a little louder, for sure, is something that, that would be audible. Um, and you can see the width of this guy is the same as width of these things, but perceptually, they're not at all the same. So let's take this example further. And this is an article, by the way, that I wrote um, for Widescreen Review Magazine a few years ago, and I'll put a link in the description where it talks about this in detail. This has a lot of applications. Um, both in just simple frequency response measurements, but also in, in measuring your room and acoustics in your room. And if you don't understand this, you can really chase your tail uh, strongly. So uh, this is a, actually a measurement of, of a speaker I have in a room and uh, at high resolution, basically no filtering. And look at what the frequency response in room looks like. If you've never done this, it's like, whoa, what is this? You know, no way is this the frequency response. Are we really hearing all this wildness? Well, obviously, we're he not hearing this wildness, and it's because of ERB, but uh, truly, this is what you get. Why do you get this? Because direct sound comes to the microphone in here, but so does all the reflections from every surface. Since they all have different delays, they're out of phase with each other, and they mix up and essentially make this random waveform that you see in here. Every time a, a waveform gets delayed enough to be out of phase, it will actually cancel, resulting in these sharp drops, and if it's the other way around, it will actually add. So it's a complex thing. 
Now, a microphone is, we say it's a dumb thing. A microphone has no psychoacoustics analysis and neither does a simple measurement like this. But your brain and, and your hearing system does not hear this. How does it hear it? You need to go and smooth that, um, smoothing means filtering this, the ups and downs, equivalent to what your hearing system perceives. So if I'm interested in knowing what's happening in high frequencies, this one third octave filtering will give me that. But in low frequencies, now it's lying to me. It smoothed out all this stuff saying there are no ups and downs. Well, that's false because there are clearly ups and downs in here. And one third of an octave is way, way too wide to show that. So what you really want to have is an adaptive filtering where you filter very little at low frequencies and you filter a lot at high frequencies to get an idea of what is your room sound, if you will. Um, I, an example of applying this uh, is when I reviewed the uh, Odyssey uh, room EQ. And uh, here I'm measuring my own reversal onto uh, speakers. And uh, it's sort of a before and after correction that's performed. You can see how messy this, this graph is, right? It's high resolution again. But here, all these little peaks actually mean something because they are audible. The bandwidth in here is well more than 10 or 20 hertz. And here you want to get a filter correct. If it's at 14, no, 14. If it's at 35 hertz, you want to put a filter at 35 hertz. You want to find this exact peak in here and put a 35 hertz. And then you want to adjust the width of the filter to be only this wide. You don't want it to go past in here because then it'll change this area. So. In low frequencies, up to about 100, 200 hertz, all of these things are real and the peaks and valleys here. When you get up here, this is all garbage because this is not what you hear. Low frequencies, what you see is what you get. High frequency, what you see is not what you hear. And uh, so to, to see what would we perceive as just overall tonality, forgetting about as much about the ups and downs, I went ahead and did the one third octave filtering. And then all room equalization system have a, a, what is called a target response curve. And this is the preferred one with Odyssey. You have to go, uh, then on Moran's have an app where it'll let you edit that. And that's what you want to have. This, this stock one doesn't have this and, and it screws things up. But anyway, it wants to achieve this line but this line, this target has no ups and downs, right? So it is as filtered and as smooth as possible. So we were, we got to get take our frequency response also and smooth it out also so we can see where we stand relative to this target. Now, by the way, this microphone I use is a crummy mic. Uh, it was the mic I think came with AVR or something, and I don't have the calibration for it. So... You know, it droops down here, ignore that. But here we can see that we're more or less tracking this target, but in here we had a big deviation and Odyssey went ahead and, and corrected that uh, in here. And then, excuse me, it tried to follow this curve until, you know, we lost the calibration on this thing. So it's very important to uh, pay attention to uh, you know, the filtering that you use. And this is a feature, this is Rumi Cube Wizard that lets you go in there and, and filter the response on this thing. Now, let's go back to the original 43, uh, 49 uh, speaker that I reviewed, and I might do a standalone video on this. Uh, the biggest flaw in here was that, it actually had two flaws. One was that there's a dip in here, the crossover, and uh, then there's also the Twitter level is elevated uh, up here. Fortunately, it has some dip switches, which I'm showing down here, where you can take this and knock it down. And this would be quite audible because it goes from 2 kilohertz all the way up to maximum frequency of 10 kilohertz plus. All of it is elevated. Uh, it's the classic thing of thinking that more highs sell speakers better, and, and they do, so, even though it's less accurate um, uh, in there. So, but. A lot of people were horrified of, of this dip, and I was upset at it too because Harman tends to, uh, parent company JBL, it knows that this has to be flat for the best sound. So I went ahead and listened to it, and I dialed in an EQ in there, uh, and that's the equalization that I put in inverse of that. It seems like a very large correction in here, right? It's uh, 4 dB, 
and at 1500 hertz so that's that's a lot of boosting in here but i tell you the effects are quite subtle uh, it is not at all night and day turning and turn it on and say wow listen to all the now it was very subtle it was a good change needed to have that eq in there um but it's very subtle so he, here's an example of the eye deceiving us and why is the eye deceiving us because the erb here is not this narrow in here is you're probably getting the filter banks are averaging fair bit. Uh, let me go back to the original graph. Averaging these fair bits. So clearly we're not hearing a big valley in here where we're hearing chunks of it average in here and chunks of it average here. And so it's important to listen. Um, a lot of people are shocked when I say when it comes to uh, uh, room EQ and, and room sound reproduction, your ears are, you must use your ears and because your ears and your brain work together to uh, tell you what you perceive. And, uh, you know, single graph uh, measurements can be quite misleading. So you got to have the skill to either apply psychoacoustics manually, like I've been teaching you right now in this video, or uh, go ahead and experiment with equalization. So um, take your current system, um, bring up a parametric EQ. It has to be a parametric EQ. Why? Because it has this Q value at the bottom that I've set to 2.5. And when you set that Q value, that changes the uh, how wide the uh, filter is, how many frequencies it impacts. Go ahead and, and uh, take the same filter and put it up at, at 10 kilohertz or eight kilohertz and vary its shape. You'll notice that if you make it quite narrow where Q is five or six, you'll turn it on and off. It'll actually make no difference. You can make it like six or eight dB peaks or dips and you can turn it on and off. You know, it'd be very subtle to no difference at all. Why? Because again, your hearing filter bank at high frequencies is very broad, very lazy. And therefore, if you make a correction in the middle of it, a little sliver in that, it doesn't change the total energy much. And if it doesn't change the total energy much, it's not an audible thing. So for that reason, I, I see a lot of people going out there and taking, making headphone measurements like this, and they come up with tons and tons of filters. Uh, when I do my equalizations, you see very few filters. Uh, even like this one in here, I put in here, was very subtle uh, on this thing because again, it's it's quite narrow in here. Um, I sometimes go ahead and experiment by putting some other corrections in here, uh, but their difference is next to zero. Um, people who use a computer program to generate these filters, uh, the computer program just takes this uh, uh, frequency response here and attempts to flatten all of these things. It will flatten this little thing in here, it will flatten this, it will flatten this, it will flatten that, and all of a sudden you have 18 filters in there. But if you go in there and turn those filters on and off, you'll notice that many of them will not make a difference. I, like this little thing in here, 2 or 3 dB bandwidth is like 300 hertz, this is just not audible in the way it seems. The other thing is that these filters don't act in the way you think. They're, they're shown in pretty graphs like I have in here that this is what they think they're gonna do. But usually they have some spillover effects and the actual response isn't precisely this. So that's another reason to, to not do that. Um, recently I was watching somebody's video on, on headphone tuning and uh, 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 this little $9 Sony headphone I've reviewed, and I said, but EQ can make it sound good. And I just put a few filters in there. He said it sounded terrible with those filters, but then he went and said, I created my own without measurements, and he wound up with 30 filters in there. My 30 filters, there's no way with 30 filters you can have anything that's that's uh, resembling what psychoacoustics tells you. Of course, it's very easy to imagine that it makes a change, by the way. You can put a filter in there and think that you're reducing the highs and your brain may say you're reducing the highs. So a lot of times there's this on-off switch you can see here. I'll close my eyes and I'll turn it on and off randomly where I don't know what state it's in. Then I'll switch it back and forth to make sure that I'm not fooling myself into thinking that uh, the filter is making an effect or not. And if, if, if the effect is not large, I'll leave it out um, and I'll just show you the major ones and uh, usually if a product requires more than four or five of these filters uh, I give up anyway it just means the designer didn't do a good enough job in in uh, 
you know, fixing all the flaws. I don't mind fixing one or two things or with my preference in here, having more base boost, but not me becoming a designer uh, on that thing. So uh, bottom line is just be careful in looking at frequency response measurements. Uh, always in your mind have a little uh, psychoacoustic simulator that says, ah, these are audible, like this little peak in here likely is audible and then in this case was a good thing. Um, uh, but it also gets uh, combined with room modes. So that's another topic we'll talk about in the future. So this interpreting the low frequencies in a loudspeaker is got its own complexities beyond what I talked about. But the foundation is what I said. The uh, changes in frequency response earlier matter more than later in frequencies and how wide they are makes a bigger difference in audibility than the narrow ones. So these little wiggles in here are just not audible because they you have to get lucky for a musical note to just hit that right there for it to be half a dB louder. And with music having many tones, you're just not going to hear that. Whereas something broad like this, yeah, there are more chances of musical notes hitting that. So this, this obviously is, is audible. Okay, so hopefully you learned something, uh, and uh, if you already knew all these things, then great. Uh, a number of people on the forum, on ASR forum, know these things, uh, but I imagine most people haven't been exposed to the full theory from start to finish, and I thought I'd do this video. Okay, see you in a future video. Bye-bye.